Hello, my name is Robin Mitchell and welcome to this very special podcast for Electropages. Today, I am joined by the one, the only, Mark Himmelstein, who is, or Himmelstein, depending on how you pronounce it, who is the CTO of Risk 5 Thank you for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. Good to meet you. Fantastic. Now, before we jump into the questions, one quick one for you. Could you uh, describe to the audience who you are, what you do, and the things you do in your free time? Uh, I'm Mark Himmelstein. Uh, I, I am the CTO for Risk Five uh, International, and um, you know we, uh, you know, my, me and my team are responsible for helping the members be successful. We have over seventy groups. Half of them are doing specs. Half of them are doing strategy, uh, and. Uh, you know, all of them are working to help make the members successful, uh, you know, with their own products. And, and that's kind of what I do. Uh, what, what I do in my own time for, uh, for fun, uh, I travel. I love to travel. Uh, I also write poetry. I've written over a thousand poems and I also love to cook. So uh, oh. uh, those, except for the travel, all those things uh, help me get through COVID. <laughs> Oh, well, I have to admit, I've, I've not actually heard of an, of an engineer doing poetry before. So that is, a, that is a first. I mean, personally, I like to do a few IQs, but I tend to do that with my uh, with my friends as a bit of a, as a kind of like an in, in joke thing. But uh, yeah, that's that's absolutely fantastic. Um, now, for the audience out there who may be wondering, I have a small board next to me and I would like to present this to Mark uh, Himmelstein. This is a Risk Five development board done and it's been uh, manufactured by WCH. So I just want to let you know, we've got a Risk Five chip in the podcast with us today. Wonderful. I... I... I have my share of them oh, sorry, here, and I in fact oh fantastic! And in fact, I I have um, a laptop, a RISC five laptop. So uh, oh, blimey! So, yeah. So who who uh, who manufactured that? Uh, the, the laptop. I, I think it's uh, Deep uh, Impact or something. I, it's a it, it, it's a, right. a firm in Asia, and uh, they've been working for uh, you know quite some time uh, to get this out and. It boots, runs Linux, very cool. Right, that does sound pretty uh, interesting because I, I personally am waiting for more Risk Five de uh, desktop systems to come out because I'm quite excited to see what how that's going to change the area. But my first question to you, um, could you just give us a bit of a background into your uh, involvement with Risk Five? Uh, were you there at the start, or did you join later, and uh, how that's all developed over the years? Uh, it, it actually, <laughs> my my involvement started in the '80s. I, I was an employee 45 at MIPS uh, uh, Computer Systems, and and so um, uh, you know, fast forward to you know 2019, and uh, my some of my colleagues asked me if I'd be willing to throw my hat in as CTO, and I. I was uh, doing some consulting at the time. I said, sure. So I threw my hat in and then COVID hit. And, you know, every couple months I'd get a request for a couple more interviews. And then all of a sudden mm. in May of 2020, um, they said they were going to make me an offer. I said, really? And they said, yeah. Uh, and, and really, I, I had no idea how um, incredibly uh, pervasive and successful Risk Five. Um, you know, was and and is going to be uh, and and is and and it, it it's just been a, an incredible pleasure to help the community uh, be successful. You know, there's you know we don't require reporting, uh, but but there's tens of billions of cores out there that have been shipped for profit. Uh, we we know there's a nearby manufacturer, for example, in China that announced about three months ago that they had already shipped uh, three billion themselves. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's just amazing. We're, we are actually, we are changing the world of computer science and uh, it's really great. I mean, we, we love competition. We, we all came from other architectures. We're very fond of them, uh, but mm -hmm. we believe competition breeds innovation. And, and I think, uh, uh, you know, we're showing that every day. Now, in terms of architectures that we all come from, uh, mine, weirdly, is actually the Z80 uh, assembly uh, set because it's one of my favorite. Um, and I suppose, I, actually, that's a good question. Um, before Risk Five, what would you say is your, or was, your favorite instruction set? Well, I, you know, I'd say the early MIPS instruction set was simple and elegant. And so I have, because I was there, mm. I have some, some proclivity to that. But I, I worked on, you know, Spark with a C, uh, uh, PPA, mm. Power, um, you, you know, so I've, I've worked on uh, just a bunch of them. And, um, and so, um, you know, for me, simple and elegant is really very cool. 
And I feel like what they've done with RISC-V uh, is the most simple and elegant uh, ISA that, that I've seen in, in, in you know, mm. four decades. So, um, so I'm, I'm very excited about it. And, you know, I think that there's uh, benefits, you know, to uh, implementers who are, you know, implementing IP or chips, as well as to developers who are building software and, and ecosystems around it. So it's interesting how you mentioned about uh, Risk Five having billions and billions of cores out there, um, because uh, a couple of years back I actually wrote an, uh, an article on the Electra pages, and, and it basically said, um, you know, there are tens of billions of cores out there, but the thing is, where actually are they? You don't you don't see computers with the Risk Five logo on. You don't really see microcontrollers being advertised as being Risk Five that you can buy and put onto a chip onto a board. Sorry, until until these more these sort of uh, development boards came out. So where are these cores currently used in? Uh, it, it's really everywhere that you can think of um, in the different strata of computer science, right? It's everything from, you know, these very small. So for example, uh, if you're doing home automation, two of the major home automation mm -hmm. SOCs are Specif and TE-Link. They're both all RISC-V now. Um, you know, the earbud manufacturer I mentioned before, uh, you know, there's uh, Pine64 that's doing, uh, soldering irons with RISC-V chips in them, uh, you know, we... A, a, a soldering iron with, a, sorry, a soldering iron with risk five in the chip, in the, in the soldering iron itself. Right here, yeah. So how does that work? Oh, you know, they did it because they could. <laughs> They did it because they could. So those those are the finest words an engineer can come yeah. up with. We did it because we could. Yeah. Well, you know, Pine sixty four is is an org that does create some uh, products that are, uh, you know, they're done for the interest of the community to show mm. what's capable of being done. I, I mean, I know that there are there are people working on hearing aids, on canes to actually, you know, watch, you know, how far people go. Um, you know, but all mm. the way up, you know, edge computing, there are people who are building routers, 5G uh, back end uh, uh, computers, uh, desktops, desk size, you know, SoftGo just put out a, a desk side, um, uh, you know, SBC inside. That's a, you know, very cool little box. They showed it at uh, the China yeah. summit during the summer. Uh, but then you start going up and there are people who are working on making servers you know, all the way from, you know, a pizza box kind of thing, all the way up to, uh, you know, high performance computing, you know, Barcelona supercomputer, hmm. uh, the, um, uh, the European processor initiative, uh, you, you know, um, there, there's just a huge amount of, of work that's going in at all levels. Um, uh, uh, again, of the computer science strata. The reason why you don't hear about it at the low end is because they typically don't you know, first of all, we don't have like a, uh, a, a risk five inside kind of campaign. Um, it, you know, people mm -hmm. choose what they want uh, to do as far as advertising, whether it's just five or not, and we don't require reporting. So it, it's really hard, but you know, everywhere, NVIDIA, their, their video controllers probably have like 10 risk five cores on each one of them. Snapdragons, you know, they announced uh, 600, over 650 million had shipped last December. And that was before the new versions of Snapdragon with a lot more with five cores, uh, taking over you know dedicated functions. Uh, you know they're 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 not at at running the uh, mainstream uh, computation yet, ah. but, but they will uh, you know over time um, in various companies. Mm. Uh, but if you just take a look at our um, our membership, you can see that on the membership page of our our website, you can see the who's who of making you know again everything from the bottom <laughs> all the mm -hmm. way to the top and and it's really exciting I, I i don't know about you but i get up every day and get my feed from google and linkedin and i see new products being announced every single day uh so uh, so i you know i'm just blown away and it's it's really exciting um you, you know again i think we give a lot of freedom with respect to um, you, you know, licensing and, you know, mm. you know it doesn't, it's a, it's a free to use standard, just like Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. Um, and, and, uh, you know, people can do what they want. And so we give people a lot of flexibility. And in the end, that's why they come to risk five. They want that flexibility, not just with respect to licensing, but they also, you know, we allow people to make custom instructions. We allow people to pick and choose mm. which piece of the ISA they want. 
Um, and as you go up the stack towards more, you know, you know, desktops and servers and stuff like that, there's a lot more interest in sharing the load because, you know, you're doing general purpose computing. So you have, you know, zillions of applications out there. And the reason we're a community is because yeah. we share that. So uh, a lot of the work that's done inside of RISC-V these days is, is really not ISA stuff. It's, we call it non-ISA. So things like IOMMUs and, and trusted execution environments for security and so on and so forth, all that stuff is really heavily used, uh, you know, as you go up the stack. Uh, at the bottom, we've done a lot of extensions specifically to support uh, embedded and, and IoT and, and, yeah. and, and things like that. Uh, but, but those folks are running a single purpose application like an earbud, right? You know, they're, they're not interested mm. in general purpose computing. And so for them, you know, they're happy with what we provide um, uh, and, and, you know, whatever else they need, they, they do themselves. Uh, but there's less interest in, in you know, uh, helping port, you, you know, uh, uh, you know, Firefox or something right? <laughs> because they, they yeah. don't need it. Right. And so uh, so we, we have a just a very diverse community that's, uh, again, going from, you know, our tosses and and bare metal all the way up to, you know, very, very sophisticated, um, you, you know, uh, operating systems that are, you know, running on, on very big machines. Now. It's 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 quite it's it is, I still find it incredibly fascinating to hear that there are so many Risk Five devices out there and yet you tend to not see them like you mentioned about the the Nvidia uh, graphics uh, systems where you might have Risk Five cores on there but it's not even mentioned and I think as you said the chances are these types of cores are probably being used for dedicated tasks and not some generic processor that's running generic code like an operating system, um, but what what do you think is the biggest challenge that risk 5 faces when trying to penetrate markets and 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 be used by engineers in general um well i i will tell you um you know i i think that we actually make it easy right remember we're living in a sort of an eda renaissance you know things like you know chiplets and modularity have become you know just you know uh, par for the course it's pe what people expect so it's a lot easier for somebody to go grab a RISC-V core and put it into a design today than it would have been 20 years ago, right? And so, yeah. um, so you know, we make it easy. I, I think that, you know, we aren't um, a company that, that does implementations. We specifically work on standards and are implementation independent because we don't want to play favorites any more than somebody like Wi-Fi does. They don't, you know, adopt a reference implementation yeah. of, a, you know, a Broadcom or something like that. They just don't do that, right? Because they're independent. They're, you know, in fact, we are incorporated in Switzerland. We're kind of Switzerland for this stuff. Uh, and and so my job is to evangelize Risk 5 and help our members be successful in whatever they're doing. Um, and, it, mm. you know, it, it's really exciting. But... But I think with regards to challenges, what would you say is the biggest challenge that Risk Five currently faces? Uh, you know, that's that's really uh, you know hard to say. I mean, right now, I think that uh, there's just runway in certain components of the industry. So, you know, if you take something like IoT, you can get a chip out there in six months, right? If you all of a yeah. sudden you do a disk drive, it's a year and a half from the time you have a part, right? Um, servers are three to five years. Automotive can be as much as, as eight years out because of all the hmm. ISIL and you know all the other um, uh, certifications and standards they, they need to do. So I, I think when people take a look at what we're doing, um, I think we are uh, in different stages of ramp for different pieces of the computer hmm. science spectrum. And you know I, I think the hardest thing is be patient for this stuff to come out. I I think I think that makes a lot of sense. It, it kind of it, it does remind me a bit of um of military applications where you might have the latest technology now, but you can't implement it until you've proven it for ten or fifteen years that it's got you know the reliability and stuff. And so and so what you're saying is that in the case of Risk Five, it just needs time. It just needs time to wait for uh, new markets to open up to to be to be able to use Risk Five in like automotive applications where testing does take a well, long time. It needs to be proven, and you I, I, in that kind of yeah, sense. Yeah, Robin, I I think the markets are open. I think it's just a, a little bit of a uh, 
you know, ramp time in order to actually get the product out. Mm. I think that that that's really what what more more is about. I mean, you know, take a look at the uh, uh, the recent um, uh, uh, announcement of this consortium with Qualcomm and Bosch and NXP and a bunch of people on yeah. automotive. Um, they believe there's a market there. Uh, take a look at the supply chain through automotive, like from Andes, who does is an IP vendor, and they sell to Renesis, who, who you know adds the automotive piece, and then they sell to ASUS, who makes an SBC specifically for automotive. So those things take some time to mm -hmm. happen, and 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 they have, and I think you're going to see uh, an acceleration of that over the next uh, two yeah. three years. Uh, again, you know, I think things like server and and um, uh, automotive, those kind of things, they just take some time in order to bake. And uh, but I, I don't think it's waiting for the market to show up. I think there's a, a great demand for RISC V from everything I've seen. Um, and yeah, you know, uh, but you know, time will tell. And, 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 and I think I, I think I think that demand is quite self-evident when you look at the number of cores that are growing every single year. Um, and, it's, and, and it's especially in China, where they where they face numerous restrictions on things that they can import, and and they and they've had to turn they've had to become more independent in their semiconductor industry, for example, and they've turned to Risk Five as being the solution for them, and I think it's worked out quite well so far. Yeah, um, and, and, and but, I will tell you that that um, uh, China's uh, quite interesting because they were doing a whole bunch of proprietary architectures, and now a bunch of those proprietary mm -hmm. architectures are moving over to Risk Five, and uh, China. You know, China Academy of Sciences, Rios Labs, which, which is a, a, a joint venture between Berkeley and, and Tsinghua University, they've made like incredible contributions, uh, operating systems, compilers, uh, prototype boards, uh, uh, formal modeling, uh, architecture tests. So they're, they're not just like sitting there reaping the benefit of RISC-V, uh, they're actually Absolutely. Uh, on the could, ground. Yeah. Uh, making great contributions along some well, way. Well, well, I think I, I I think the WCH range of products, for example, demonstrates that quite well because yeah. I've not seen many companies out there produce microcontrollers that the the average engineer like me could buy off the shelf yeah. and use in a board because they're not they're not quite accessible. I mean, I know you've got companies like Sci-Fi who do produce high-end microprocessing systems, but they're not you know they're not trivial to use. You can't replace an STM32 or a PIC32, but this thing could in that case. But on that topic though. This is where I get it gets a bit interesting, and I've got a question for you. Recently, it was I think it was only about a week or two ago, U.S. lawmakers were um, essentially trying to push or to prevent China from having access to a lot of Risk Five IP. Now, I don't know about you, but personally, I find this I don't like this move, and I personally don't like it for the reasons that you just stated—the fact that China provides a lot of development in this area. But what's your opinion on that subject? Oh, it's really simple, Robin. Uh, and, and Callista Redmond, our CEO, actually put out a blog explaining this, and that was picked up by the same uh, venues that, that you know, started this discussion. I, you know, I think it's mm. always uh, fun to, to put something controversial out there or sounds controversial out there. Um, but, you know, if anybody would suggest today that 4K TVs, that, you know, Wi-Fi, that Bluetooth, that floating point format, would be restricted from uh, being developed uh, and and shared with the whole world, uh, it, it wouldn't happen, right? I mean, every mm. it, it's just a, a given. The difference here is we're the first time an ISA, an instruction set architecture, has be, been put out as a standard. And that's why we've worked very hard yeah. not to do implementations. But we are just like them. You have to think of an instruction set architecture as the protocol between software and hardware, yeah. right? And so uh, I, I think once uh, everybody really, you know, gets that internally, they'll they'll figure it out. Now, that doesn't say anything about implementations. I mean, you, you know, yeah. U.S. export control can go ahead and control, you know, Wi-Fi chips that are shipped places the same way they can control RISC V chips that are shipped places. We don't talk about that because we don't do implementations, right? That's up to the yeah. members. They do implementations. It's up to, to uh, the members' countries and whatever kind of regulations they want to put in place to either restrict or enable, you know, um, a, you know, global th thought. But nobody in their, you know, in in their wildest, uh, you know, 
dreams or whatever would, would ever consider making a standard restrictive. And uh, I think it's just mm. going to take a little time for people to understand RISC-V is a standard. It's not an implementation. Fantastic. Now, I have another question for you, and it's about this upcoming RISC-V summit. Could you just give us a bit of background as to what, what's going on there and what might be covered? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's very exciting. Uh, we're, we're, finally, we're finally finally moving to the conversation which you might be more comfortable with, not, not the geopoliticals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's more in my bailiwick. Yeah. So we have three summits yes. per year. Uh, we have uh, one in China, one in Europe, mm -hmm. and one in North America. The one in North America has, right. has traditionally been sort of the, um, the keystone summit, uh, you know, because mm. it, you know, RISC V started in Berkeley. Uh, you know, so, some of the major startups and other companies, uh, you know, are in, in the USA, but we expect to have global participation. Um, we have uh, something like uh, 30 technical talks and about 15 industry talks. Uh, we have a, an incredible amount of opportunity for people to socialize. We have a RISC-5 101 where, you know, people who are just getting into RISC-5 can, uh, uh, can, can mm -hmm. join in and figure stuff out. We have a members day where, you know, people who are working in the, in the task groups and creating specifications can see each other face to face because most of the time we're on you know, on video conference. Um, and, uh, and it's sort of three days where we get to show people, you know, what people are thinking about technically, um, give them a chance to network. And, uh, you know, in general, uh, the buzz and excitement from these things is, is just amazing. So I think part of it is to get people mm. energized and, uh, you know, cause every day we're in, in the work a day, you know, you get up in the morning, you do your thing. And this, get you a, a chance to step back a little bit and see the bigger picture. And when you see everybody else doing things, then you get excited and you know what's possible. And it's very, uh, very, very cool. I can imagine. I suppose when you see that many people working on the project that you personally have been developing, um, it's, it's kind of like watching your baby grow, I suppose, isn't it? Um, now, um, in terms of the uh, upcoming summit, is there anything you could share with us today as a bit of a sneak peek that you might be presenting? Oh, I'm, I actually, I got relieved of presenting this time. We had a, a smaller, oh, venue, no. smaller venue and less. So I gave up my slot for some other people, uh, but I'll be there uh, in, 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 you know, every day and uh, lots of meetings uh, and, and, you know, lots of presentations that I'll be present, you know, be, be there for. Um, and, um, you know, mostly again, networking and hopefully, uh, encouraging people, helping solve some problems, hopefully along the way. Uh, and, um, you know, just bring some general excitement to the whole process. But, Fantastic. Yeah. Now moving on, um, to specific products and solutions. I'm kind of curious, what, could you give me an example of what you would say was the most interesting project that you've worked on with regards to risk five? Well, Again, I don't work on projects for RISC V. We work on standards and specifications. Uh, this year, yeah. I will tell you that likely before the end of the year, we'll have somewhere around uh, 14, 15 specifications that have been approved, and three of them are huge. Um, the first is a thing called profiles. And if you uh, right. think of a generational group of instructions that other architectures have, either you know, a, you know, a, a generation like, you know, Xeon for, you know, whatever, or ARM V6, yeah. ARM V7. So profiles are, are that for RISC V. And so this year we ratified our first profiles, some of the stuff that was done back in 2019, uh, and then some stuff that was done in, in, in uh, 2021. Uh, and so, uh, you know, just a huge, huge step forward because that's what we tell the, the operating system distributions and the compiler tools to target. And that's how we, you know, uh, you know, the community gets together and is unified and saying, yes, go in this direction. So that you don't have to do a hundred different things. Um, and then the second one is uh, something called IOMMU. Uh, and, and this is how you memory map IO uh, in, in a system. This is one of the example of one of the non ISA specifications. That's really very, uh, very exciting. Um, and you can't build a system without an IOMMU, even it's a very simple one, you need one. Of course. Uh, and so we had five different specifications that came in, 
uh, the team did a great job in making it into one. Uh, it got ratified, and we're, we're really excited about that. And then the third one uh, is Vector Crypto. So last year we did uh, Vector, and we got Vector approved. Um, uh, you know, this year we did Vector Crypto. So you can do things like, you know, the NIST um, uh, algorithms or the Chiang Mai algorithms uh, from China uh, with a single instruction using the Vector unit. And so uh, all oh, three fine. of them were huge. I mean, we're talking about uh, profiles took two and a half years. IOMMU took a year and a half. Vector Crypto it took three to four years, depending on how you count. And so um, right. big work by the team. So I've got, so I've got a question about that then. Um, so as I, and I could be completely wrong, so correct me if I, if I am wrong. Um, the impression that I always got from essentially the two main major uh, processor types, you know, your CISC and your RISC, you've got your complex instruction set and your, and your reduced instruction set. Do you feel that um, with all the extensions and all the new instructions and the ability to do like, as you say, the vectorization in like one clock step, does that border on the complex instruction set architecture? Does that, does that, does that move away from the reduced instruction set um, principles? Yeah, I, I, I don't really think so. I mean, again, you know, go back and take a look at what power looks like. IBM's power. Hmm. I mean, it's a very large instruction set. Go take a look at ARM64. It's a very large instruction hmm. set. Both consider themselves to be risk, right? And then, you know, things like, you know, Sun's Spark and, and you know, the MIPS architecture, uh, both evolved over time to include a, a lot of instructions. I don't think the number of instructions is what determines, uh, you, you know, whether something's risk or assist. Um, you, you know, I think it's more about a frugality and a hardware software trade off um, and, uh, mm. you know, making sure that it's easy to go ahead and decode the instructions, execute the instructions with mo multiple functional units, uh, et cetera. So, I mean, you can go back to, you know, again, John Hennessy and, and Dave Patterson and, you know, they they kind of wrote the book. Right. And so you can see that it's 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 not necessarily. Uh, the, you know, the number of instructions, but I will also tell you that we worked very hard to make fewer instructions. So we have a lot less instructions mm. in our vector unit, but the same functionality. And we actually, I mean, if yeah. you take a look, we actually have some similar uh, instructions to what you saw in a Cray one computer, you know, in the seventies. So it's, uh, uh, mm. there, there are techniques that, you know, stand uh, the test of time and uh, people know how to use them. Uh, we've had a number of people implement the vector unit and everybody has said it's, it's like the, the easiest one they could, you know, had implemented. Some people had actually done the implementation for x86 and then worked mm. on the RISC five one and said that, you know, the way the instruction set was set up, it was really conducive uh, to, to getting it done quickly and elegantly. And so, and so, this the the idea of risk versus CISC is more more uh, obscure, uh, and, and you know, a bit a uh, bit of ambiguity. No, it's I don't think it's obscure. I mean, I think that there are some uh, you know you know standards, and and rather than go into that, I, I again I would forward you to to Hennessy and Patterson and and, and their book, and hmm. you know they explain these things really well. Uh, and I think again, you know, it, it's a it's a hardware software trade off. And, uh, you know, we've worked right. very hard to have, um, you know, we have uh, multiple size instructions, but we have fixed, uh, you know, uh, with instructions to make it easier to decode. Yeah. Um, you know, a number of our members are doing, uh, you know, hyperscalers or superscalers or, you know, massively parallel uh, SIMD machines, you know, yeah. got Esperanto with a thousand uh, cores on a die. Um, it's, it's just a thousand cores, a thousand cores on a die. Yeah. Um, you know, both, God, both the things like inference blimey. engines and also, um, mm. you know, large data center kind of, uh, things. So it, it's, it's, I think, and so do you, and so on that topic, do you think risk five could have a lot of application in the AI field? Um, considering think, the fact that you can get it, so many cores all, onto one die. It already has. I mean, there, there is no question. Mm. We have an, a, we have one AI ML, uh, uh, group already inside of RISC-V. We're about to create a second one. Uh, people are doing a huge amount of AIML, and some of the things that AIML need to succeed are actually uh, underway right now in RISC-V because 
we we are growing the instructions. I mean, we're not done. Uh, so things like matrix multiply uh, are underway right now uh, in the organization. Mm. So uh, all that stuff's going to help out. I think um, AI and ML. I think I think one thing one thing I would like to say about Risk Five because I, I I think Risk Five is one of the most um, I think it's one of the most or potentially has has the most um, opportunity to change to fundamentally change how microcontrollers microprocessors can be built in the next 20, 30 years. But I do feel like, do you feel like that Risk Five isn't doing enough in terms of marketing? Because I do, I, I, you hear about all these processes that you never hear about. You've got AI that I, I didn't even, I wasn't even aware that you guys are working on. I, this really needs to be more public. It really um, does need to be more public. I well, think. actually, come to summit. I mean, all of these topics are being talked about in, in there you various, go, the various talks. Yeah. Um, we also have, you know, on the website we have a blog. Uh, that that people put out all the time. You know, members uh, can put out mm. blogs and they talk about what they're doing in AIML. A, a lot of people, you know, like Tens Torrent uh, is a recent, uh, you know, more recent member, and and they very clearly have a place in the AIML world. This Esperanto, as I, I discussed, but but mm. the truth is, Robin, that AIML is showing up either in the small or the large all again all through the strata of computer science because mm -hmm. there are things that are needed uh you know at every level whether it's you know some kind of um, uh, smart speaker or or again the yeah. soc for uh you know for for home automation they need a certain amount of that so uh, we see people integrating pieces of this in order to make uh, you know those things work in their environment, and then there's the big stuff, right? Again, you know the Esperantos, yeah. the superscalers who are building big machines uh, in partnership with a bunch of uh, industry uh, you know vendors in order mm -hmm. to make sure that uh, they can go ahead and and um, make make the best out of this five. And so, I think I think it would be fair to say that what. The fact that anybody, because you have, because anybody has the freedom to look at the standard and develop their own Risk Five processor and then not mention it in the design, it's it's all it's almost a bit like a double-edged sword because, on one hand, you know you've got this free uh, standard. It means that you know it's compatible with all the software that's already out there. You can implement it into your design, and then you don't tell anyone you've used it, and then you don't get that you don't get that publicity that it's been used in a product unless someone mentions it. Right, except that you know you're seeing more and more people talk about risk five in their designs uh, that is true know, meta's yeah. ai chip right um they, yeah. they got their ip from an ip vendor in the risk five environment um they're going to be one of the speakers at um at at the summit and they're going to talk about their experience with risk five uh at the at the mm. last uh, at the barcelona summit we had bosch come in and talk about uh their experience uh with risk five their goals for risk five for automotive so uh, so the summits are really good places. The, the, the website's a really good yeah. place. Um, look, we, I, I agree with you. We always can do more. Part of my job is evangelism. That's why I'm here <laughs> to, to speak to you and to your, your audience. Um, but, you know, again, I don't think it takes very much. I mean, I just, I, again, I look at my Google feed and, and LinkedIn every day, mm. and there's a never-ending stream of people uh, using RISC-V for, for various purposes. And, and, and I, I too have a I, I too use Google feeds as well, and I'm, I do see Risk Five on the on a daily basis. I I just personally feel like that, um, be, like you say, it because people can use it in their own designs without having to put a great big Risk Five sticker on the front of it. You know, it, it it does make I think it does make it a little bit harder to to, to get general public knowledge on it. Um, so en so engineers, for example, are very well aware of the Risk Five chipset. But if you ask the average person on the street, he'll he'll be aware of what Intel and AMD are. But beyond that, you know, they, they won't they won't know what Risk Five would yeah, be. Yeah, well, they, and I they, think that's a real shame. I think it's a real shame. Yeah, most people don't know what ARM is. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. that's when, true. When, yeah, that's when true. When I yeah, my, my cell phone up and go, yeah, you know that there's a computer chip in here. It's it's called ARM. That it's based. You know, what's ARM? And, uh, and most people have no clue. <laughs> I, you know, I'm frankly more interested in the success of our members and their customers in order to do stuff. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll, again, I'll leave it. I'm not a marketing person. I'll leave it to our marketing folks and our CEO to talk with you more on this subject. 
I, I agree with you. We always can do more. It's just, just that's the way it is. You can always do more. Uh, but I think we're doing an yeah. incredible amount. And um, uh, stay tuned because you're, you're going to see uh, even more over the, the next uh, upcoming years. And that is something I'll definitely be, uh, be keeping my eyes out on. But going back uh, part of the conversation, because there was something I wanted to ask you about. Um, now, I have to admit, when it comes to the instruction set itself, I, I don't know how to use RISC-V uh, assembly instructions. So I'm not familiar, I'm not entirely, I, I mean, I've seen some of it, but I'm not entirely familiar uh, with the instruction set like I am with the Z80, for example. Um, and I know that in a lot of older processes, um, you would have uh, dedicated IO instructions, because I want to go back to the IO MMU you were talking yeah. about. Um, now, Traditionally, as I, as I understand it, with a lot of modern microcontrollers, you tend to have an I.O. mapped memory, you know, so if you want to talk to some peripheral, you just write to a specific area in, in, in uh, memory. Um, so could you go into a bit more depth in, in depth into what this IM, I.O. MMU is actually doing for the user? Well, uh, again, um, for the user, when they go ahead and they're on a computer and, you know, all of a sudden you access a disk, um, you somehow have to have the disk communicate with the processor, right? And yeah. how, you know, what, where does the, the disk um, DMA, you know, direct memory access into the processor's memory? What are the rights of that section of memory? Who gets yeah. rights to it? All those things are covered by the IOMMU. But I will tell you, Robin, that today's world is even more complicated because it's not like the early 1980s where there was one paper on, on security for Unix, right? And, and that was it. <laughs> In that there, there's yeah. a, a, a plethora of, of um, threats and mitigations that need to be mm -hmm. put in place. And for example, you know, we have a thing called IOPMP, which sets up memory ranges that, you know, certain people have rights to and not have rights to. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I.O. is really, really critically important to us, uh, and it, it rears its head in a number of places. How do you boot a system to an operating system? How does an operating system uh, or a hypervisor give rights to a guest operating system? You know, so on and so forth. All those pieces have to be worked out uh, for a processor. There is no uh, architecture totally independent way to do this. There are some standards out there uh, like on boot up, you know, UEFI, for example, uh, gives you access to, to yeah. various devices. Um, but in, in general, you know, you have to lay down the tracks on this stuff and it interacts with the CPU in interesting ways where you have to basically set up registers with, you know, the rights or pointers to data structures in memory that have the rights in them. Uh, and, and all these, uh, you know, products uh, 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 depend on this stuff. Um, you know, security isn't free, and um, and but we all need it, and so we ha we have a security model um, uh, document being worked on right now by one of the groups, uh, and it will actually be the one ring to bind them to, you know, tell you what you need to do there. A big part of that is is I O, uh, and so it, right. it's really a, a very uh, critical thing. You know, we've we've seen an increase in. Uh, and all sorts of threats uh, over the years. Uh, and it's just amazing. I mean, if, if, if we think uh, uh, there's innovation in chip development and other things, there's also innovation in hacking. And, and so- we, Yeah, like, like the side channel attacks have been quite, right. quite, um, and so we, quite impressive actually, to be fair. Right, and we have uh, significant work in mitigating some of the side mm. channel attacks. Uh, you know, some of the costs of mitigating that is, is pretty expensive and it's up to the vendor to decide whether they want to implement it or not. Uh, and in more hardened situations, they, they do. Uh, so all those things are being worked on and it's it's quite impressive. Well, in, on, on that note, actually, um, side channel attacks, wouldn't that be a result of the implementation, not the instruction set architecture? Um, it turns out that there are certain things you can do in the instruction set architecture uh, to mitigate certain attacks. And then multiple implementations right. can take advantage of those those things, um, and uh, th there are, there's a just an, an incredibly wonderful uh, talk at last year's summit in December that you can get on YouTube, and I you know uh, link can, can grab a pointer to that for you uh, by a woman named Allison Randall who who just does a great explanation of 
what the attacks are and what you can do to mitigate them and what risk five mm. is, is doing so uh you know we're, we're uh, going full speed on on all of these aspects fantastic now just before we wrap up this podcast um i've only got one more question to uh say to you which is for the engineers who are watching this video right now, if they want to get involved with the Risk Five Foundation and want to contribute or use your um, offerings, what would you recommend that they do? Well, uh, you know, if you want to get involved with the, the discussions of, of the evolving instruction set architecture, or uh, you know, the other engineers that are you know working on on their implementations, uh, the best thing to do is join Risk Five International. Uh, it's free for individuals. Uh, you know, it costs money for for uh, for profit companies. Uh, and, um, you know, there are opportunities to uh, be on the board of directors and things like that, uh, that, that are, you know, higher uh, cost uh, kind of entries. But for individuals, it's absolutely free. You can go to, you know, uh, all the technical meetings. Uh, we have a hierarchical structure where there are committees, like there's a security committee and there's a, you know, user level instruction committee and stuff like that. And then underneath that, there's a plethora of efforts that are underway that people can, can do. Uh, but if you want to go ahead and, and like start doing development on RISC-V, uh, QEMU is a simulator. Um, uh, Spike is another simulator. So you can actually run you know, RISC-V um, uh, simulation on your machine uh, you know, with standard compilers and you know, standard tools. So uh, both the GCC uh, you know, brand of stuff and LLVM. Uh, mm. You know, they're, they're all available and very easy to use. Uh, we're also working on creating a clearinghouse for software. So it'd be easier for people to find all the pieces uh, and get a little bit more status on where their favorite piece of software is with respect to this five. That's absolutely fantastic. Well, all I can say is thank you ever so much for joining us today on this podcast. Oh, hey, it's my pleasure, Robin. And, um, you know, I hope that everybody is successful and and helps us change the world with risk five. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.